Make sure you guys hit the subscribe button if you guys are enjoying the content that we're throwing up. And uh, make sure you guys hit the like button if you enjoy the video. And yeah, let's begin. Okay, what's going on guys? This is Rob and we are covering King in Black Part 2. Yes, we are. We're, we're in King in Black, the official second issue of King in Black. I guess it's not really Part 2 because we, we had what? Like the Venom tie-in, then we had the Incredible Hulk tie-in. I still need to do Iron Man and Doctor Doom because I feel like that one's insanely good. Uh, but we're covering Part 2 of King in Black, right? Issue number two. And this basically picks up with Eddie Brock like falling presumably to his death, or at least it looked like his death, right? We had that amazing issue in Venom where the whole thing took, took place over the span of something like, what is that, like 33 seconds or something like that? It's like this just, it was amazing the way that it was done so eddie broad crash lands down into the ground right like like literally hitting all these different things along the way he crash landed down to the ground spider-man comes swinging into the rescue right now here's the thing spider-man is like one of the last heroes standing here in new york right there's there's a few others and we'll find out who they are but for the most part most heroes are basically gone and the initial thought of spider-man is like he like eddie brock is dead and he tried to race back here and get to eddie as fast as he could but he couldn't right now here's the important thing to understand about this this is one of the coolest things right and it's not heavily mentioned here and it's only really something you pick up on if you've been reading for a reasonable amount of time. But this whole scene is beautiful and amazing, right? Because these guys have been enemies over the years, right? They've been pretty extreme enemies over the years. Eddie Brock first showed up, well, not really first showed up, but when he first became Venom, he was like Peter Parker's sworn enemy. He's like, I'm going to do everything I can to kill you and destroy your life. And he went after Peter Parker's family, the whole nine yards, right? It was just asymmetrical war on Peter. And now you have a scenario where Eddie Brock looks like he's about to die and Peter feels feels totally ashamed of himself that he couldn't make it here in time, right? Screaming for help, calling for help. Now, Eddie Brock wakes up and then basically tells Peter, like, Dylan, right? Promise me that you'll look after Dylan. Now, for Noel himself, he kind of makes this, this sort of sort of funny remark. And it's like, honestly, how hard is it to kill one man? Well, not hard if you do it properly, Noel, because all you had to do was, like, tear his head off or rip his heart out of his body or rip him in half or tear his arms and legs off or any number of the things that you could have done besides just dropping him to his death. Here's the funny thing about this like obviously it's, it's like this is for the sake of the story but it's one of these funny things where like you have villains in comic books who get frustrated over the fact that they can't kill us kill a character all the while glossing over any one of the infinite number of easy ways to do it right like any one of the infinite number of easy ways to kill these guys and so it's kind of a, a funny little thing to me but ultimately like the spider sense of peter parker kicks in when he's suddenly met by an optic blast from cyclops and that's when he realizes all these heroes that were fighting here in new york they were not killed by null they were conscripted into Null's army. Now, we largely assumed this is what was exactly what was going to happen because we saw Venom Beyond, right? And we saw this alternate reality where Dylan basically became a person who conquered Earth and essentially turned all the superheroes to his side by forcing symbiotes on them. And in some cases, if they were already dead, turning the symbiotes into those guys. But the long and short of this is that we kind of saw this coming, right? And so Peter Parker basically tries to get out of there as fast as he can. But for the most part, he kind of seems trapped. When out of nowhere, right? Out of, out of nowhere, where comes Johnny Storm, right? Now, here's the funny thing. My initial thought to this, my, my initial thought was, oh my God, that's right. Johnny Storm has a built-in immunity to symbiotes because he can flame on, right? Like that's that was my, my immediate thought. And then I was like, oh no, wait a minute. These Grendels are not like Venom, right? They're stronger than that. You can't just torch them with fire and call it a day. Otherwise, all you would do is have the superheroes running around with aerosol cans and lighters, right? Just spraying down everything in front of them. And that would be it, right? The story would be over like that. It'd be, it'd be over lickety split. But it's so cool here because because Johnny Storm could easily be kind of just written in here it's like the saving grace and he has had those moments right you guys remember in Jonathan Hickman's Fantastic Four when like the portal opens up like like literally the portal to the to the negative zone opens up and like it opens up inside the Fantastic Four Baxter building and like like everybody's panicking they're freaking out like Johnny goes in there he's like close the portal behind me right so they shut the portal behind him he turns around faces like this horde of like like a billion members of the annihilation wave and it's just like flame on right and then and then like it cuts like it, it just ends and it's like dude it's like the greatest cliffhanger ever in the history of comics it's like this amazing moment but but nonetheless johnny storm has had those moments and where he realizes that yeah he can't really just blast the symbiotes with his fire and kind of bring them to an end he goes so far as to say then fine i'll let off my nova blast when that happened peter parker's like let's go right because when the nova blast goes off from johnny storm if you're in the vicinity you are dead and there's no arguing that point it's literally the sun exploding is what it is right he like he reaches i think at or 
over or near the temperature of the sun when he does his nova blast right just lets everything off now the downside of this is when that happens it's basically expending all of his energy at one time of course he passes out and that's something that peter parker says like if you do this you're going to pass out and they're going to take you he's like yeah i know but it can buy you time right it can buy you time to get out of here and so that's exactly what peter does right he webs up eddie brock he gets them out of there and then he takes them over to the home base the the laboratory of the fantastic four in the baxter building now here's the thing we basically end up picking up here with Valkyrie. Now, for those of you guys who don't know what's going on with the character of Valkyrie, Jane Foster now plays that role. And what Marvel did here in the aftermath of Jason Aaron's run on, on Thor, uh, I love Jane Foster Thor. I don't really care if you didn't like it. I loved it, right? And your opinion is not going to change mine. But I love the whole story there. But what they ended up doing is because Odin's son was going to go back to being Thor, just like I always said he would be because it's comics and everything old goes back to the way, everything goes back to the way that it used to be, right? The status quo is always maintained. That this led to Marvel kind of shuffling Jane Foster out, right? She got shuffled off to the cornfields and her own own comic that was never really advertised all that well. And uh, and she's basically been Valkyrie ever since. What does she do? She basically shepherds those from the land of the living to the land of the dead. And the reason why this matters is because she has this kind of power or ability more or less to know how close somebody is to death. And where Peter Parker asks, how close is Eddie Brock to dying? She's like, well, you know, I can tell you enough to say you better hurry up, right? Because like he's basically almost done with all his living. So it's like, okay. So you basically end up having Peter Parker who goes and he grabs Dylan. Now, as soon as he gets into this room where Dylan's being hidden, as soon as Dylan sees Spider-Man, he's like, okay. Like basically like he asks the question, is my dad dead? You know, is, is my dad basically dead and gone? And Peter's response is no, like not when I left him, but you know, we need to get you and we need to get out of here. Now, something to understand, this is kind of an interesting thing here. Peter can't really look Dylan in the eye. And it's a small thing to notice. It's a very, very small thing, easy to overlook, but this is shame, right? A person who can't look you in the eye whenever they've done something wrong is a person who's shamed or feeling guilt for what it is that they did wrong. Peter believes he did something wrong by not being able to save the life of Eddie Brock. Again, tying into this history between the two and how significant it is. But once we end up having Peter grab grab Dylan and then head back to the Fantastic Four's uh, base of operations, there's a handful of heroes here, right? We've got Reed Richards, we've got Susan Storm. We don't really know where Franklin and Valeria are. Presumably they're being kept somewhere safe. You've got Black Panther they're here you've got blade right you've got um you got charles xavier and and magneto who were showing up in the form of holograms and you literally have blade asking them like open your gates right so we can basically go there and you have no idea how many people you can say the smart thing here for xavier and magneto to do is to actually keep their gates closed and the reason why i know on the surface it seems kind of callous and kind of cruel but in times like this you can't let the wrong people in and when i say the wrong people all it's going to take is for one symbiote that nobody knows about to be bonded to a person and they're not even aware of it right it's it's just stowed away on a backpack or something like that. And then suddenly the entirety of Krakoa is basically being taken over by symbiotes, right? Noel knows exactly how to get there. He goes in, just busts into the place and they're all taken over, right? So the smartest thing to do in any situation like this is to shut your doors and to say, no, you can't get in, right? We're, I'm sorry about your luck. It sucks that things are going south, but we can't take the risk of losing our people because of what's going on out there. Uh, sorry about your luck. Hopefully you find a better way to take care of it. Now, the X-Men don't necessarily leave the other superheroes hanging. They're like, we can formulate a plan together, but we're not going to open our doors and let you in because we're going to let the wrong person in and everything is going to come to an end. The other part of this is that Black Panther starts asking questions, says, okay, with everything going on here, like, yes, Wakanda's obviously going to fight, but what do we have in terms of like huge weapons of power, right? Do we have the Infinity Stones, the Cosmic Cube, the Ultimate Nullifier? What do we have on hand that can bring an end to Null? Now, the response of Blade is, do we really need that kind of firepower? And Valkyrie kind of chimes in and is like, you know what, Blade? Here's the deal, man. We're talking about a guy who existed before existence existed, right? And then, like, he killed he killed some Celestials. He was locked away for a little while. Now he's back, and he's taken over the Celestials, so he's powerful enough to conquer Celestials. He's here on our world, and we're losing by not even a little bit. So, yeah, I kind of think the idea of talking about the Infinity Gauntlet or the Cosmic Cube or the, the Ultimate Nullify is kind of a good idea because at this point what what else do we have left it's literally been less than 30 minutes and we've all pretty much been conquered right in the span of 30 minutes pretty much all the superheroes on earth have been totally taken over now this is when we get the introduction of namor the submariner now this is a cool thing here because susan storm is the one that called him in now reed kind of pulls her aside and says hey can, can we kind of talk privately for a second and the reason why is because namor and susan storm kind of have a history where they pretty much just bumped uglies a few times right like she kind of cheated on Reed a few times. At least Marvel heavily alluded to it. There were a couple times when Marvel was like, no, 
she never actually did. But if you go back and you read the original source material, she pretty much did, right? I mean, that's basically what happened. <laughs> At the very least, there was the idea of her leaving Reed for Namor. But but Namor shot, you know, showing up here is kind of like, look, like here's the thing. My entire race has been fighting in the shadows for millennia, right? Like we've been fighting all these crazy enemies that are out there. You're losing this war and you're losing it by a lot, right? So if you want to succeed, you're going to need my help, right? Now, my people are here and my, my guys are here. Does anybody here have anything that even remotely resembles a plan? And Tony Stark chimes in and says, I do, but it's going to be crazy, right? It's going to be a crazy, ridiculous plan. So he's got, he's like, I've got this plan and I've got a few others that I'm trying to work on here. But what, what we need to understand here is that Eddie Brock is the only one that's going to be able to save us. And I need to get one of the dragons from Null, right? Now, here's the thing. If you're a superhero in this room and you're like, does anybody here have a plan? And Iron Man's like, yeah, man, but I'm going to need a dragon. It's kind of like, okay, cool. Let's go see if we can find a dragon. And like, <laughs> you don't really question the plans of Iron Man, right? Tony Stark is a futurist. He's always thinking in the future. And depending on the circumstance, he's actually smarter than anybody else in this room. Again, it depends on what situation that we're talking about here. But because he thinks about things in a, in a far more interesting way and in a far more new, a far more nuanced way, thinking more about the future than thinking about today, it really puts him a cut ahead of everybody else. And so one of the things that happens is we have this group called the Black Tide, which are basically like, what is it? The things from uh, Aquaman? I, I don't remember exactly what they're called. Like in before DC fans are like, see, Marvel steals from DC. In before those guys, because you know they're gonna post in the comment section. <laughs> <laughs> but um but yeah like it's basically these enemies that are out there that Iron Man knew about that uh that 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 name of the Submariner didn't think he did but these guys are powered by like dark magic but the idea is to rally them to their cause at the same time you have Blade who travels travels to Chernobyl uh in Ukraine and then basically tells like Dracula we need your help you switch to the bar with no name in New York and you have the you have the mayor of New York Wilson Fisk the kingpin who comes walking in and is like does anybody want to make some money right it's it's all hands on deck. It's basically like there's no more villains in, in this in this whole situation. There's no heroes, no villains. It's just survivors. That's all this is. And we're all going to have to like put these problems aside and work in unison if we're going to pull this off. Now, for Iron Man's part, he ends up taking off and, and literally flying into New York and then traveling to one of the dragons, right? Now, the reason why the dragon is being used is because these beings seem to have the closest connection to Null than any other of the other symbiotes that are out there, right? So it effectively makes them the strongest, quote unquote. And so Iron Man basically gets in there and says, okay, cool. You know, I'm going to have to essentially rewrite this guy's DNA, right? I'm going to have to treat it like a computer program, right? If I have a computer program that's not working the way that I want it to, then I just rewrite the code and then get it to do what I want it to do. That's what he's talking about here, right? Rewriting the DNA of this entire thing to make it subservient to the heroes and, and really to kind of follow the direction of Iron Man as opposed to following the directions of Null. The problem with this is that while he uses Extremis and he gets in there and starts, you know, kind of manipulating this guy's DNA, starts tapping into it, what he starts to realize is that these are all connected through a hive mind. Now, we already knew that, right? We as the reader already knew that a hive mind is what connects all these things under Null, but they're all experiencing constant pain, right? Pain, anguish, suffering. It's just millions of voices all screaming at the same time to the point that it actually starts to overwhelm Iron Man. Now, ultimately, it does not. And it basically leads to him traveling back to where Eddie Brock is and then taking the symbiote and then pouring it onto Eddie, right? Taking this Grindle, putting it on Eddie Brock with the belief that once it bonds to Eddie, that Eddie can maintain himself. And if he's able to maintain himself, he can in turn travel directly to Null and then essentially create a back door that allows the superheroes to get in and find some way to conquer Null. The problem with this is that as soon as the Grendel starts bonding to Eddie, things start popping off, right? His vitals are just spiking. It looks like he's going into cardiac arrest. It's it's too much for his body to handle. And, it, and it's one of these things where we don't know if it's because of the injuries he sustained or if it just simply is too much for him, right? The nature of the Grendel itself is something that Eddie Brock simply can't handle on his own. Now, the whole time this is going on, right? The whole time this is happening, Dylan is trying to get the attention of the heroes, right? They're like, we got to find a way to pull it off, right? We got to find a way to get this thing off. We got to find a way to pull it off. And Dylan's like, guys, guys, hold on. Everybody, I need you to move. And they're like, no, it's, it's, we're trying to get this off. The whole time they're ignoring Dylan, right? And he's just like, hey, and he like screams and he's like, I said move. And then like blast the symbiote, like blast the Grindel 
off of Eddie Brock, like literally disintegrates it in one touch. Now we knew that was the power of Dylan, right? Dylan had the ability to con to destroy or control symbiotes, right? We know he has that power. He's very similar to Null in that way. None of the other superheroes knew. And because they're adults, of course, they don't listen to kids because adults feel like they know more than kids. Uh, and in a lot of ways they do, but kids have something that, that most adults don't have, which is imagination. And so this basically leads to them realizing, oh my God, this kid can be our secret weapon, right? We're obviously not gonna have him march out in New York and start blasting symbiotes with his hand. No would scoop him up in an instant, right? But he is our secret weapon. If we can formulate a plan around him, then we can basically find a way to win. The problem with this is they start hearing this noise, right? There's just a kind of the, this explosion. You have this, you know, kind of deep, deep, you know, and then it's just beep. And that's when you realize Eddie Brock has flatlined. All the other superheroes here and Dylan realize that Eddie Brock has basically just died. With that being said, guys, we're gonna bring this video to an end. If you are new here to Comments Explain, Cliffhangers, if you are new here to Comments Explain, make sure you guys hit the sub button to become part of the Rob Corps. If you guys enjoy this video, make sure you drop a like, and I will catch you all later. Peace.